Uh, I've been talking all week, cough. Oh, no, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Welcome to another Bad Boy Meets. I've got my good friend Ramsey Farragher here again. Ramsey, good evening. Hello, Sam. Ramsey is an expert in, uh, in sensing. So I've got him here for a little quick live stream that we wanted to do. So I want to introduce the topic uh, here, Ramsey. I think you can, you can see the tweet that we're, uh, we're going to be sort of discussing and diving into because I, I think... Although it looks quite superficial on the surface, it goes into some quite interesting and, and deeper areas. So there was a tweet went out yesterday from Commander Chris Hadfield. So for those of you who don't know who that is, he's a Canadian astronaut. And uh, so someone who we've got a lot of time for, uh, a lot of respect for. Um, but we were intrigued by this tweet. So he put out this tweet and uh, so just sort of zoom into it. Um, and what he was saying is, it's kind of strange that humans haven't developed a sense for infrared and radio waves. And the reason being that that's surprising is because a lot of radio waves, a lot of uh, infrared reach the surface of the earth as well as visible light. So essentially, why did evolution choose to go one route and give us eyes that are um, very attuned to what we call visible light? So why did it pick that uh, frequency spectrum? and not pick infrared and radio waves. Now, I was a little bit stumped by this at the start, so um, I got on to Ramsey because I thought this might be a really inspired observation. And when we drilled into it a little bit, it's maybe, to be kind, not quite so inspired. So Ramsey, what are your initial thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, my initial thought was it's, there's there's some obvious reasons why um, we might have driven towards using uh, light instead of the other things. So one direction you can come at this from is that the picture you've got there, you go from radio through infrared through visible to near ultraviolet. Yeah. The frequency is getting higher as you go in that direction. And that means that the resolution you can achieve when you're sensing the world with those different types of electromagnetic radiation is getting higher too. And what you want to do is to be able to sense the world with the highest resolution possible mm. and see from afar tiny objects like that lion that's running towards you. <laughs> you can run the other we way. We want to see that. that as soon as possible. Well, it still yeah. looks good. far it's away still... is small. Close up is big. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and from that uh, from that sort of direction of logic, uh, you would want to make sure that uh, your adapting and evolving the ability to see with the highest frequency radiation available to you, which is conveniently enough, the visible light stuff that we use. Um, and then there's kind of some other factors as well, which is that in the same way that the highest frequency stuff gives you the finest resolution, you also need the smallest um, collecting areas uh, and kind of dimensions of your, your aperture um, to make good use of it or focus it, etc. Uh, so, you know, if you were sensing the radio wave um, kind of spectrum, you might need collecting apertures that were meters big, like the huge telescopes that we we used to look at, um, we use for radio astronomy or the big Yagi antenna on your roof or the big satellite dish on the side of your house collecting um, radio signals from. So it's not uh, so it's not that hard. Well, it's not that easy to hide from a predator when your eyes are three meters across. And yeah. everything you see in the world is basically a fuzzy radar mess. You, you also wouldn't see that predator because radio waves don't bounce off uh, <laughs> issue very well. So if we were trying to avoid metal objects uh, as we were sort of evolving, it might be useful. Um, but, so if we uh, evolved trying to escape from Decepticons or some sort of Transformer, then maybe this would have been the, 
the way that all exactly. the way that we decided to go but unfortunately yeah. well a lot exactly a lot of radio waves um penetrate uh things like wood and trees and objects like animals and stuff i mean it's the reason we use wi-fi uh, in our homes you put the wi-fi access mm. point wherever you like and it punches straight through all of the things that you would otherwise walk into like the walls so that's no uh, good for seeing things because seeing essentially means that we need to discriminate between different things and if the yeah, wall yeah. and the empty space roughly behave the same with respect to the penetration then how are you going to get any sort of delineation between a wall or a lion and yeah. the air around us if you only saw in radio waves you'd always walk into the trees <laughs> yeah. okay so it seems like there's a few reasons there that we wouldn't see in radio waves so one is you'd need massive collecting areas because I guess the collection area scales with the, the, the wavelength of the, of the radiation to some extent. The, the radio waves pretty much punch through everything so you wouldn't get any sort of delineation between squishy things and, and harder things. Um, to, so, to put so it simple. For the broadest amount of radio waves, you, you, can do things, you, you can do things with ultra wide band, use lots and lots of radio frequencies and then they do bounce off objects. But um, yeah, in the, in the kind of simplest sense of looking at this problem, go for the high frequency stuff that bounces off objects that you're trying to avoid, like lions. It is kind of, it, it is kind of interesting. It can't be coincidental with evolution being, you know, this mechanism that tries to push you towards survival that we developed eyes that just so happen to have the highest resolution given the window of what is available that seems like too much of a coincidence although i believe there are um and i think you you've told me this before that there are creatures i need to look into this more i'm quite interested to do a, a sort of deeper dive video into this but i believe there are creatures that see in ultraviolet as well to potentially get even even higher resolution so if you, yeah, if you, well, if you ever shine a, a UV lamp over flowers, you'll see patterns. I think we have that, a nice picture of this actually. If I can, if I can just pop it up for you. So, um, I've got so many, the, so many links yeah. open so that we can see these things. There we are. Yeah. So we don't see this normally, but if you shine a UV lamp over it, um, you will see uh, this, and um, uh, it's assumed or probably known uh, through scientific experimentation that uh, insects uh, are attracted to these patterns and kind of, you can imagine it as acting a bit like uh, like a runway strip of saying like, the interesting stuff is here. Here's the pollen and the nectar. <laughs> All I can think it, of is one of those like horrible t-shirts that point towards like people's private parts. But essentially the fun times are here. It's pointing, if you want yeah. the pollen, here's the uh, here's where you need to go. And, and yeah. I mean... It's, it mentions in the in the in the Google that I look for this. So under ultraviolet, the flowers have a darker center, where the nectaries are located, and often specific patterns upon the petals as well. This is believed to make the flowers more attractive to pollinators such as honeybees, and other insects that can see in ultraviolet. So there are some creatures, which have developed this ability to see, in ultraviolet, but it's not something that we developed and, and I, I actually think that this is one of the sort of flaws in the original tweet obviously I don't, I don't want to rip someone for a tweet we've all said you know stupid stuff or, or said things that we think are really interesting and intriguing and then realize eh, um it's not so much but um i think one of the problems in this tweet is that there's a there's a misunderstanding potentially and this is a physicist jumping into biology so anyone in the in the comments or in the live stream please feel free to correct me but I think there's a, a problem with seeing in the tweet biology as a sort of um, optimization machine. So why can't humans see UV in radio waves? Why don't we have a radar dish sticking out of our head? Well, because we don't need to. Evolution isn't geared to make us optimal. We don't have to be as strong as a bear and as fast as a cheetah and have the eyes of a hawk. We just need to be good enough to find a niche to survive. So the eyes that we have, the high resolution eyes that we have, means that we don't need a radar dish spinning out of our head and um, ultraviolet night vision. Um, do you think that's a fair comment? Infrared night vision, even. Uh, um, infrared night yeah. vision, yes. Well, it wasn't a yeah. fair comment. Is it a fair comment apart from the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the wrong end of the spectrum there? 
yeah, I, I, I think it's right that um, you don't need to evolve perfection in every single factor. Um, and of course, that's what we see. Different creatures have evolved different capabilities just so that they survive in the environments they're in. So, mm. you know, famously, you've got some creatures that are completely blind and um, navigate using sound or feel instead. And um, uh, it's literally kind of survival of the fittest for, for whatever environment you're in that means you're fit to survive it. Yeah, so there's many there's many different ways to skin a cat and it really depends which sort of environment you're in. So maybe if we were more of nocturnal creatures, maybe it would be advantageous to or have a niche which was more nocturnal, then maybe we would have developed more infrared sensing organs although it should be noted we do have infrared sensing organs which the tweet sort of doesn't allude to because we can effectively sense which way heat is coming from like the sun for example um so that's not exactly true but with our with our niche in the daytime we essentially essentially don't need a lot of these these things that might be hinted at yeah exactly and and you're absolutely right like um you could you could navigate away from a massive burning bonfire with your eyes closed just by yeah. going like that and walking in the cold direction so we, we definitely sense infrared uh just yeah, we're, we're pretty eyes. good at avoiding not walking into fires or not baking in the sun so yeah. i think it's that i think that there's a slight misapprehension or, or a sort of sort of confusion in the tweet between seeing in infrared and sensing infrared um, why Why would it be, we talked a little bit about why radio waves might, might not be good for a, a sensing system with a biological um, creature. Why might infrared not be so good? Is it because it's, it's hard to delineate between hot objects during the day, again, in that niche that, that humans have? Yeah, well, you're definitely, you're, you're suffering that resolution problem a bit again as well. So if you've ever seen infrared imagery, um, it's lower resolution. Everything's blurrier than vision uh, normally. Um, so if you've seen and, if you've seen Predator, we'll 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 know this, right? The uh, maybe I can get a picture of the old Predator vision, um, so people can get a, a little example of what you're talking about. Or maybe we can get Arnold up. Maybe that's uh, yeah. Maybe that's appropriate. Um, and um, yeah, so there's kind of resolution issues, some dynamic range issues. But also, uh, you know, we famously uh, use infrared for night vision purposes. Um, and it would be much harder if you only saw in the infrared to uh, to uh, survive in burning hot middle of the sun, middle of the daytime, very sunny conditions, um, because everything, there won't be much dynamic range. Everything is reflecting infrared uh, from the sun back at you. And uh yeah, you'd you'd, you'd uh, suffer issues of effectively just being whited out in in certain conditions if you only saw an infrared. I guess we see this in films, right? If somebody's wearing infrared goggles and they go outside, or the lights are turned on, everything is flooded with radiation. They have to they have to take the damn things off before they scorch their retinas or whatever, because everything is going to be washed with IR. Um, so again, you've got that problem just as with the radio waves. That how are you going to get resolution between different things if everything looks white hot in infrared um yeah. and, and i guess as as warm-blooded creatures as well we're already emitting loads of infrared ourselves so if you had eyeballs squishy eyeballs in a sack of infrared emitting warm flesh i guess you're already you know onto a bit of a hiding to nothing because you're gonna have such high noise levels from inside your own head i guess yeah, so the, the concept of night vision goggles is that um, with the sun away, um, uh, only the stuff that's radiating its own IR and emitting shines out like that nice little picture of Arnie there, mm -hmm. and all of the foliage around him is much colder, mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, it would be much harder to distinguish um, the active infrared coming out of a warm body in blazing sunshine conditions when every surface is reflecting a lot of IR back at you um, and you wouldn't distinguish between the natural IR coming out of Arnie and all of the infrared <laughs> bouncing from the sun off everything and coming towards you. So it seems like it seems like some some creatures do actually do this. So, you know, I've been doing a little bit of research and uh, obviously there are some. The snake, for example, um, 
is very good at detecting infrared. So it has these what they call pit organs, um, which is essentially a, a recessed pit, as the as the name suggests, um, with a membrane and a cavity and fibers running off it, essentially like an optic nerve, I guess. And the infrared that comes in can, I guess, excite electrons that then go along the fibers to the to the brain and, and tell the snake essentially where heat is coming from. But I guess this works probably better in the nighttime and is more to do with the the niche again in which the snake lives. Yeah, or hunting down inside a uh, like a, a small mammal's home that, you know, a rat that lives in a burrow or something. And this thing's going down in the pitch dark to try and eat the rat. It's the same as the analogy I used before about if you're blindfolded and trying to stay away from a bonfire. Um, well, if you flip that round and you <laughs> go and cuddle the bonfire, then you could, you know, have your hands out. And and it's exactly the same. The, the snake uh, is able to sense on two sides of its head the presence of a nice warm rat that it's going to try and eat down a, a rat's warren or whatever the name the name of a hole a rat lives in is. So this really... other animals are available for snakes to eat. I presume rat is a good choice. Yeah, other uh, other other snake food is available, um, but so I guess that what this all comes back to is a slight. Well, the main issue is essentially a difference of niche, right? We do, we don't we don't use radio because it's probably got because well, it's got all those drawbacks, and we don't need it. We don't use IR because it has all those drawbacks, and we don't need it. These different creatures have um, different niches in which they live. And therefore, sometimes in some situations that we've el elucidated, these uses of different frequencies, different dynamic ranges are useful. But for us as day livers, not very nocturnal hunting, we don't need it. A big brain and opposable thumb seems to be enough for us to have a niche in which we can survive. So evolution isn't we don't have the selective pressure to, to push towards a radar dish out of the top of our head. Um, is there anything we talked about? IR the the failures or the or the difficulties with infra infrared sensing and radar sensing, and we mentioned here with the snake that it, it does do some infrared sensing in the more sort of traditional sense of eyes, quote unquote. Is there anything? Are there any creatures in the animal kingdom? I'm trying to think. Obviously, biology is not our strong subject, so all these arguments tend to be around sort of dynamic ranges and. Uh, diffraction limits physics arguments uh, and i'm sure we're stepping on some biologist toes so any uh, biologists and chemists feel free to step in but are there any animals that you're aware of that that sense radio frequencies as well but the, the only one that springs to mind or the, the idea i had was was maybe birds that need to follow the sort of magnetic yes, lines of the earth and there's a couple of things there's definitely the robin um which i'll i'll talk about and but in the course of talking just now just remember that sharks um can sense electromagnetic fields yes. there's actually um there's actually uh, uh devices you can mount to surfboards that are basically a battery um uh, uh with a, a wire looping around that um prevents sharks coming to you close to you because <laughs> of their sensitivity to electric fields but the robin is an interesting one so is that um, is that before we move on to the robin is that is that is that currents though, or is it? I guess it's electrical field, so it's a bit of a. Obviously, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, electric field, you therefore have photons. So you have, you know, you have a certain a certain frequency range of photons that are being passed and forth in that electric field. Is that is that more the the current directly, or is that is that a field with photons being passed around? I I don't I don't really know anything about sharks to be honest to know, but I know they. I think it. Um, from what I can remember from nature documentaries, it's that, that lateral line or, or something like that that can sense or some cells in its face. I can't exactly remember what it is that can detect these tiny electrical fields. Yeah, um, they're certainly the most electrically sensitive animals that we know of, according to the Wikipedia page I'm reading right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, um, when you're a physicist, sometimes you've got to uh, get your sources on the biology side. What, what um, does it say? Yeah, so... Um, it, it certainly it certainly will be um, electrostatics that it's sensing from the looks of things. Mm. So yeah, it's sensing it's sensing currents that are being generated in the in the water that it's in, um, as opposed to absorbing photons of electromagnetic radiation. Um, but 
uh, th yeah, th there are a number of, of creatures that can sense um, uh, electric fields, including ourselves, if you've ever touched the live wire by mistake. Um, well, you can so you can. I, I don't know if you can, if this is a thing that's that's true or it's just you're sort of sensing a little bit of the electricity already electrocuting you, but you can sort of sense when you're close to a high voltage discharge, right, without being electrocuted. You can sort of, I don't know if, if we have any sort of sense of being close to electricity or, or whether it's just the nature of how the environments that's been changed that maybe there's a different smell in the air because things are yep. being ionised and such or whether we're actually having any sort of sense of yeah, yeah. electricity, and, and quote, it, quote. It, Yeah, a lot of it is probably, um, as you say, kind of slightly indirect so we can smell ozone yeah uh, and yeah. Uh, ozone can be yeah. generated um uh, near very strong electric fields i remember old um, tvs used to smell really bad right because they had these cathode ray tubes in the back that were putting out ozone and they had a very sort of distinctive yeah, yeah. smell and um of course famously um the hairs on your arms and on your head can um be attracted to the the field and therefore all of the little set the nerves and things that are connected to the follicles you can feel that your yeah head moved in an unusual way so yeah we, we're kind of sensing indirectly in those sorts of ways mm. um the robin is an interesting example where um effectively uh it's been demonstrated that you can jam a robin's navigation capabilities with radar radio waves which is quite interesting so this is if this only is... they'd had this in like the second world war with the carrier pigeons right i can imagine just jamming a load of robins and them just falling to the ground and exploding on on contact um but yeah, i mean it's quite a recent study so the the investigations into the quantum robin have been quite recent so um there's it's been known for a number of years that um the the robin can sense the earth's magnetic fields uh, very well and actually you can do some experiments that demonstrate that the sensitivity of the robin to magnetic fields is very very high so you can you can actually use uh coils uh you can basically put a robin inside a chamber that's got huge coils in it i believe i, I need to remember this for a long time but i think it's called helmholtz coils when you set up um three loops of coils and you tune the fields that those coils are generating uh, and they can completely negate the earth's magnetic field so you can build a chamber which when you go in it has zero magnetic field in it mm. because you've set this thing up to cancel out mm. the natural magnetic field of the earth and of course and, once the, and the robin just sort of looks around and is like what the hell's going on <laughs> yeah so well the, if i take one step back it's, it's, it's like a robin thing. flotation tank basically it's, it's robin yeah, so sensory deprivation tank the, the way you do the experiment is you because it sounds you, i'm it, gonna be honest it sounds quite cruel it, well, it could be a lot worse. There's some really cool animal navigation experiments that involve cutting things' legs off and stuff. But that's a story for another day. Oh, I don't do any of that stuff. Um, <laughs> so disclaimer. here's the premise: right? you you black out the room completely, so the robin can't see anything, yeah. um, and you wait till it's uh, migrating season, and you you kind of put the robin in a uh, a little bowl. And actually, they used to use dried tipex. They might use something cleverer nowadays. But you coat tipex, the bowl with something God, that I will... remember that. I'm showing my age. Tipex, God. <laughs> so you coat, coat the bowl in something that when the robin frantically like tries to take off, it'll leave scrape marks with its feet, mm. and you can see which direction the robin took off in. And so what you do is you black out the room, put the robin in the bowl, spin the bowl around a bit, and then bash the side of the thing, scare the robin, and the robin takes off. And robins will naturally, during the migratory season, try to take off in the migrating direction. That's the premise, right? And of course, you do the experiment loads and loads and loads of times, and you get statistics. And what you find is that if you completely null the Earth's magnetic field entirely, then the robin will take off in random directions. If the Earth's magnetic field is available to the robin, even in this completely blacked out room and you've spun the poor thing round, so it's got no idea which way it's pointing before you okay. scare it and make it fly away. Um, then when the Earth's magnetic field is there, they'll generally take off in the direction of whatever direction they're supposed to be migrating south or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. The interesting bit then comes that you've dialed out the Earth's magnetic field completely with the Helmholtz coils and you start to put very small amounts of magnetic field back in and you can 
choose the direction of the magnetic field, right? So you can completely flip the, the field so it's pointing the wrong way or point at 90 degrees, etc. And what they found when they did these experiments, and these, this is like decades ago when they first discovered this, they could set tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of magnetic field, way weaker than the Earth's magnetic field. And statistically, these robins would keep take, take, taking off in a, in a particular direction. And so it revealed that the robin was sensing such weak magnetic fields that it's actually much weaker than some of the most expensive and complicated ways we sense magnetic fields, superconducting squid detectors, as they're called. And then this led people down the hypothesis that the only way we understand that robins could be sensing such weak, such have such high sensitivity of magnetic fields was that if there was actually some quantum effect going on inside the robin. And they've kind of tracked this to one particular eyeball, can't remember which one, left or right, um, one of the uh, robin's eyeballs has um, a particular uh, crystal in it, which is this cryptochrome thing that you've got upon it on here. And the, 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 the concept is that there's actually quantum entanglement going on in this cell in the robin's eye. And it's the quantum entanglement process that is able to allow it to sense such incredibly weak fields. And then the, the hypothesis was, well, if that is true, if that is really what's going on, then how do we determine if that's the case? Well, if it's this particular quantum effect, then if we bombard the robin with a particular <laughs> frequency of radio waves, it will stop that from working properly. <laughs> so robin goes back in chamber. Yeah, we need, we need you back in. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, exactly. And this paper that you've got up here is talking about this experiment where they found if you bombard it with the um, particular... Um, frequency of radio waves as predicted by quantum mechanics uh, sure enough the robin stops working properly so this so this, this isn't really so this isn't really evolution having given the robin radar detection it's that we're using that it is sensitive as a byproduct to radio waves so it's not yeah. necessarily something that evolution has given it to help it it's something that we're abusing quote unquote or using to to see this effect in action so it's an unfortunate byproduct for the robin of its way of sensing magnetic fields that this particular frequency of radio waves disrupts its ability to sense magnetic fields but it demonstrates that there are indeed mechanisms inside um biological, biological systems, systems yeah which are sensitive to radio frequencies of different types it's just that in this instance it's sensitive in the, in the sense that it breaks it in a way that's bad for our uh, friend the robin because he's got to get called back in for another uh, another round in the bowl now i think that, that that's incredible that's incredibly interesting i'm not actually aware of any more animals apart from i guess other birds that which are sort of in this in the same field which are sensitive to magnetic fields that's that's almost certainly my lack of knowledge yeah there's the, we know of some and we've identified it um uh, typically birds um we found that in birds there are different processes so there are some birds that it's it's a cell inside their beak um and it's kind of a macroscopic effect um you can actually i've seen some hypotheses that there's essentially a piece of magnetite or a magnetic rock in there which I guess, spins in a magnetic field and gives it some sort of idea. I don't know if that's been debunked or is still on the, from the Wikipedia page, it looks like it's still on the table as to whether that has an effect or not. So it's so, essentially got a tiny magnet in its beak, which can be moved around with the magnetic field. Uh, effectively, well, it's it's not that it's going to be moving, it's that the, it's going to be on a very fine nerve mm. so that when that, um, uh, that crystal, which naturally has like a north and a south polarity. The domains move around, it can sense the... When it tries to move, yeah. it's going to push against one nerve or the other, and that's all it's going to be. Mm. It's going to be, um, you know, it's just not that dissimilar to kind of, you know, the breeze blowing on your skin and moving uh, mm. some hairs. That that means you feel that there's wind blowing on one side of your mm. face, you know, just that it's a, a little magnetic crystal being um, tweaked. I mean, it must be a bit of a... We, we just don't have a... Uh, a way of kind of imagining what it's like but i guess it would be like literally having a feeling inside your nose that you always wanted to naturally turn your nose <laughs> because otherwise it was like slightly achy on one side yeah. than the other yeah. way to 
the achy is always point north. Yeah. Um, and we we know through some interesting experiments, uh, some crueler than the uh, dark chamber bang on the box for the robin, but we know that um, some creatures can see the polarization of the sky, and that's how they know um, uh, how to navigate. So again, some some birds and bees, I think we we know we can do this. Interestingly, we think the um, we think the Vikings um, had what they must have thought was a magic box, right? So <laughs> Viking, some Viking myths and writings refer to the sunstone or or like the navigation stone. And what we believe they probably had was, this is again actually a quantum effect. Um, if you take calcite crystal... I wonder if we um, can get a link, up, a link up for this while you're talking about it, because it sounds very interesting. What was it, the, the navigation stone? Uh, calcite crystal, Vikings, sunstone. Calcite sun crystal... Box. We'll, we'll, spam, so basically, we'll spam Google and see what it says. The Viking the, Sunstone. So, so there's there's evidence from writings that the Vikings had a magic box, right, that they could navigate with. And the hypothesis, because we found calcite crystals buried as a precious object in Viking burials. So you can see beautifully in this picture, um, what you've got there is there's a, there's a little uh, pinhole in the top of this box. And so a spot of light, sunlight, is coming down into that box. It's going through a calcite crystal. Um, and you can see there's two spots in the middle of the box. So that's two spots of sunlight, right? Yeah. Calcite crystal is is doing this birefringent quantum effect where it splits the photons into two different paths. And they have different polarizations. And the sky is polarized. Um, but when the sun is shining through it and blue light is coming down from all different directions, even though the sun is in one place, the polarization of that blue light coming down is different in different directions. So right towards the sun, it's almost uniformly polarized. And the further you move away across the sky from the sun, the more polarized the, the light is. And what you could have used this box for was basically to find the sun in the sky even if it's completely overcast mm. and you're just under cloud, because this effect still works through cloud. So obviously with the sun available to you, you can use that as a way of understanding through morning, noon and night, mm. um, whether you're heading roughly you know, north, south, east or west, etc. What this box would have allowed you to do was point it towards the sun, even if you were in complete cloud cover, because only when you were pointing at the sun would those two spots have been the same brightness pointing it at any other part of the sky and there'd have been two spots of two different brightness. So we're pretty confident this, and it's amazing, right? You know, the Vikings would have thought this was a magical device. Yeah, I can see through oh, things no, with confident. this, yeah. I can see the sight unseen with my magic box. <laughs> yeah, it must have been, because uh, obviously they had no understanding of radio waves or penetration of different materials. It, it must have been, like you say, just like magic, like a magic trick. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we know some animals can navigate using the uh, vision of the polarization of the sky as well. So um, if your eyes, or your equivalent of eyes in some creatures, um, can, can actually distinguish between different polarizations, then you actually see bands across the sky. And so you, you'd have the same effect. Some animals, even under a completely overcast sky, will see like bands moving away from this particular part of the sky where the sun actually is, mm. but it's completely scored by cloud. And I, I think it's bees and some types of birds that we're confident have polarized vision like that. You can do it with sunglasses. Some sunglasses are, are sim simply Polaroids. And if you go out on a sunny day and take a pair of sunglasses and point them up at different parts of the sky and turn them to 90 degrees, you will see that um, the sky will get darker in different orientation, mm. the, the different orientations of your sunglasses, you can make the blue sky darker in different places. And that's because of the polarization. It's really, really interesting. So I guess that to, to sum up this whole sort of discussion that we've had, there are a lot of creatures on the earth that use infrared, some potentially that, that use or are sensitive to um, radio waves, radio frequencies, um, electric fields, magnetic fields. But for humans, we just don't need it because it's not our niche um, that we're in. One final comment I wanted to make, actually, is, uh, and you'll know this as an astro, um, the picture of the transparency. Sorry, did you say astro or asshole? Uh, astro. 
Although yeah. I appreciate that the two are often uh, pseudonyms. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Particle <laughs> physics humor. Right. So we've got this picture and it's saying that infrared is barreling in. Radio waves are barreling in. Visible light is bar uh, barreling in. But I, I thought that was a it's a bit of an oversimplification, right? Because the the um, the visible comes in in a fuzzy sense. So we don't do a lot of ground based telescope because things bounce around. The photons bounce around The We do a lot of ground based radio telescopes. So this is over here at the one meter plus. So you've got your ground based radio telescope. I remember Keith Grange loved his radio telescopes down on the ground because everything comes through the atmosphere. But in the infrared, I think this is a bit of a misleading picture because as I understand it, and as this this picture demonstrates, there's only certain windows of infrared that are actually open to light yeah. coming through the atmosphere. I, I remember I did the, the video on the whitest paint. And the reason yeah. it works so well is because it, the, the light comes in in the visible, it reflects all of that. And then it emits at this like in one of these windows in the, in the infrared. So it's it doesn't absorb anything and it pumps everything out in a in a window that's also um, transmissive to the sky or transmissible through the sky. But I think that's a bit of a simplistic picture because most of the infrared, as I understand it, is sort of is sort of choked off as well. Yeah. And um, there's actually there's a, a range called terahertz, which is between the radio and the infrared. So everything that's kind of three millimeters to um, 30 micrometers. So in that in that well blocked region right in the middle there yeah. and terahertz is a uh, part of the spectrum we've only just in the last kind of 10 years really started started to use and actually you know the new um the new scanners in airports yeah the body scanners where they make you kind of stand like that and yeah, yeah. Spin, spin around fast. yeah so that's a terahertz image of you and it just cuts straight through all your clothing and is stopped by the moisture on your skin so they get they get a really good outline, basically, of your naked body. Mm. Um, and what shines out really clearly on there are, you know, knives, guns, concealed objects and stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, the terahertz region is, is completely blocked by the atmosphere there as well. What is the, um, what are the, so you're, uh, you, you do a lot of work with um, GPS, GNSS. What, what signal frequency do they use for... GPS transmissions, which I guess have to be very penetrating and, and try and not get any, you know, blockage and deviation. What what do they that, use for? That's basically exactly where the pointy bit of that radio satellite dish is. So right. 19 centimeters. Ah, is okay, so wait, so we are here exactly in yeah. the, in, yeah, the nice, exactly. in the nice open area. Yeah. You, you said about the visible stuff. Yeah, it comes through, so we can build some visible telescopes. But of course the the major problem is cloud cover and then even just basically shimmering of, yeah. of the atmosphere you know it's so you need your adaptive optics and all that sort of yeah, it's not as stuff. easy to to do all all day all night um uh visible light uh astronomy on the ground which is why hubble has been so successful but radio astronomy you know cloud cover all day all night any weather conditions you can do your astronomy all day long yeah so I'm not I'm not convinced that gives a, a great thing. I think IR probably gets knocked out a lot from it. I was thinking with radio, the one thing you could get is you could know that something was coming towards you. You just wouldn't know where from, right? If it, if you were getting bouncing off it as well. That was my only other comment that I thought while I was going through. Um, if you were bouncing radio? Yes. Um, because the thing, the, the comment that we made with the, the Teslas when they were using the radar is that Radar is very, very good for ranging, right? But not very good for resolution. It's it, it's very, very good for determining velocity. Mm. It's okay for measuring range, and it's not that great at angular resolution. Mm. Yeah. So you so might be able to know something is coming towards you, but not exactly where from. So it's pretty useless, really. You'd you would know before you were killed by the Decepticon <laughs> exactly how fast it was running at you <laughs> and die. But not along which trajectory. So radio, is, it's just a throwaway comment that I thought of. So, so yeah, so to sum all this up, um, it's probably not as deep as it seems. The, the point is, as we sort of reiterated a couple of times, is that different creatures have different niches. Uh, our niche is to be mostly living in the day. 
and therefore we tend to deal in what we now call the visible spectrum. We don't need the infrared, we don't need the spinning radar dish out of our head, but other creatures that live in different niches, nocturnal hunters, for example, things that hunt down in burrows, they do use these different frequency regimes because they have a different niche. Evolution hasn't made us perfect in terms of sensing, um, but it's made us good enough to survive, and that's that's basically the bottom line. Uh, Ramsey, before I let you go, um, there was... So Chris seemed to be on a little bit of a roll, so I just noticed before I came off, he'd posted a, another <laughs> one. Um I don't know if these are sort of uh, great astronaut wisdom or it's, I think you mentioned before, it's sort of what happens when uh, astronauts aren't allowed to go into space anymore that, you know, they, they start making observations here of the natural world. Um, a piece of grey tape around a tree and caterpillars hate grey tape. Your comments, sir. I can see what he means. Uh, there, there don't appear to be any above the tape. Um, so um, I do know that we could probably solve this by having a video instead of a picture. Now I can give you uh, some more information. Apparently, all off. apparently this is sticky side out, sticky side in, sticky yeah. side in. Yeah. So it's I'm not it's not that they famous. get stuck on it and eaten no. by the birds. But my, my initial thoughts on this were they crawl onto the tape. And then the birds can see them, right? You, you've, if you look at the bottom of the picture, they sort of blend yeah. into the tree, which I guess is their evolutionary, one of their evolutionary adaptations. But when they crawl onto the clearly man-made monotone grey plastic film, the bird just comes down and has them, which I guess is what you're saying with the video. Yeah, we, <laughs> if this runs for two minutes, you just see all your magnetic robins coming down and... Uh, <laughs> I, I bet we'd see caterpillars falling off the tape because it's slippery. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, yeah, it's definitely wrecking their camouflage to some degree. But um, uh, you'd think as soon as a bird's nipped in and had one, it might think, hang on, there's loads there. Uh, <laughs> stand at the bottom of the tree, eating them all. Um, so my... So, I, so there's, there's I, some, I, of the comments, yeah. some of the comments are priceless. I can't find it again now. I think the person might have deleted it because they were getting a bit of... They were getting a bit of um, spam for it, but they were saying, "Could somebody explain to me, please, why it is that the, the caterpillars just hate sticky tape?" And I was just <laughs> like, "Please, there's obviously something else going on here. I don't know. Maybe it's some amazing, um, you know, natural gardener solution, but it, it strikes me that it's camouflage. And as you say, probably they're not used to walking on sticky tape, so they just fall off to the ground and then crawl back up again." Yeah, I'd assume so. It's probably some amazing gardener's trick, which I'm not aware of. I guess it keeps them away from the leaves and therefore they don't eat the leaves is yeah. what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. But anyway, seems to be seems to be having fun on Twitter. Obviously a very intelligent guy we've got a lot of respect for, but I guess Twitter makes us all post some uh, slightly odd things. Ramsey, thank you so much for taking the time. A lot of fascinating stuff in there. Anything else you've noticed over the last week or so since our last chat? We've got another uh, tech roundup coming up, I think, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, exactly. Just a couple of weeks, I think you're right. Um, uh, we'll save it all for that one, I think. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. A few comments. I just want to, because a few people have been uh, have been putting their, their comments in, so I want to acknowledge those. Thank you guys for coming by. Um, I mean, seeing in infrared would be kind of hot. Nice comment. Fair enough. Clever. Bees can very funny. Uh, bees can see in ultraviolet, yes, which is what we what we jumped onto yeah. with the uh, with the uh, patterns of the uh, of the flowers, which uh, highlight where the where the pollen where the nectar is. Um, it's worth noting most nocturnal animals still use visible light, but just have much higher sensitivity. So yes, so yeah. I believe there's a lot of animals, or you, I mean, we see them on Nature Channel, which have these huge huge eyeballs or. Um, detectors which are just more sensitive to light I believe perhaps I don't know what the biology there is but perhaps more densely packed rods or cones or whichever the one is that I can't remember yeah. which one's the, the light one. the black and white one yeah so yeah. so yes it's not just if you hunt at night you need night vision um, obviously there's light from the moon 
um, potentially other sources of light, especially as humans sort of encroach more into these habitats. Um, so certain creatures can survive by um, bigger collecting areas um, for for normal, normal, quote unquote. This is an interesting comment, actually, that come just before we close up. One of the comments was, well, humans just see in the middle of the spectrum. So that makes sense, which sort of set you off yesterday, I remember, because... Obviously, the the middle of the spectrum. What the middle of the spectrum they, is? They <laughs> see in the visible part of the spectrum. <laughs> is that why do you yeah. think we might have called it that? Like, I, uh, so think, I think this is the same reason why London Greenwich is in the middle of the map. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Because yeah. that's where that's where we obviously define define relative to. So, um, but yes, we obviously only call it visible light because it happens to be the one that we. Um, that we see with there's nothing inherently about it that that i prefer to refer to it as 400 700 nanometers there, there you go so so maybe we take that away but obviously if you look at the picture of the electromagnetic spectrum it's bang there in the middle because we're very uh anthropocentric um final comment which i think uh i'll leave it for you to field here ramsey then we'll close up um those poor robins just can't catch a break It could be much worse. Ants have had much nastier experiments done to them. Go on, so, give, it, give us one of the ants and then we'll close up. So um, These are navigation experiments, right? Or sensing experiments. It's, it's, the, it's the fascinating field of yeah, animal navigation where we're... Con I say we, I want to step completely away from it. People who work on animal navigation um, find themselves trying to conduct very clever experiments to figure out how animals do stuff. And there have been experiments in the past to study why ants are as good as they are at navigating that confirmed that ants are counting steps and can count because that's an exciting thing to confirm that tiny little creatures know how to count so this is to know um, how what a measure of what distance they've gone from yeah from the colony or yeah so they've, they've found some food and then they know how to get back to their their, their, their nest how do they know that and so hypothesis that they're counting steps and, and when they turn and count steps and so on and so what you can do is you can put some food out, um, let the ant kind of go on a route away from its uh, colony to get the uh, food. And then you cut the ant's legs all in half um, and the ant only walks halfway home and then starts looking around for its nest. And you also um, glue pig hair to some other ants so that they're now on stilts and so make their legs twice as long. And sure enough, those ants walk twice as far before doing each turn and stuff. And that's historically been in the past the way that they've uh, confirmed that um, ants count steps. You definitely, so, yeah, you definitely want to be on the pig hair side rather than the uh, rather than the half yeah. distance side. That's definitely the, the way. To... Yeah, the, the way they've known in the past that you know animals are navigating because of magnetic. Um, sensing in their beaks and things is they go in there and snip that nerve off completely and then they yeah sure enough the bird can't migrate in the right direction anymore so they confirm it was a sensor inside the beak so yes historically there have been some quite cruel animal navigation experiments of which i've never been a part of any of them <laughs> we're, so we're all clear so yes so to answer that um that comment there from ab uh it could be far worse than than being a quantum robin so living in the bowl is perhaps not so bad ramsey again thank you so much for uh going through that with me that was really fascinating i learned a lot i think there's actually a lot of topics there that we could go into more deeply and i probably want to do some some videos on those so thanks again guys for coming by i hope you enjoyed the stream uh thank you for your excellent comments and uh see you again soon cheers thanks sam thanks everyone Cool. Uh, let me take.